you know, sometimes uh, the answers to life that we discover uh, are not what we expect, at least the right answers. I came across an oil painting this week of the Trojan War uh, that has that iconic giant wooden horse, right, where the, I believe it was the, the Greeks and the Trojans or whatever uh, are, are fighting each other, trying to take over. Imagine the, the war briefing that took place b before that battle took place. I mean, you're gathering your, your, your smartest minds. How can we defeat the Trojans? And the leader pipes up and says, I got an idea. I have the answer. Here's what it is. We're going to build this gigantic horse. We're going to climb inside of it. It's going to be on wheels. We're going to push it up there like we're gifting them this big trophy. They're going to take it inside the gates, and then we're all going to sneak out of it at night, open the doors, and then we can just waltz right in and take whatever we want. Imagine the look on their faces when they heard that plan for the first time. There's no way they expected that answer, right? They'd be like, well, you know, it's just, that's not what we expected you to say. But okay, you're the leader. I guess we're going to go for it. But it was the right answer. It was evidently, it was the right answer. It's what worked. But sometimes those answers that are the right answers just are not the answers we expected them to be. No more is that the case than when we are in Job chapter 38. We're finally getting some answers here. We're finally getting some answers to the questions that Job, Eliphaz, Bildad, Elihu, that they've been raising all of this time, trying to discern. Job, all this time, has just been doing what you and I would be doing if we were in his shoes. If your life is flipped upside down, everything's gone, all the plans you ever made in your life are burnt to the ground, your family's destroyed, you'd want to know why. How did this happen? Where, where, where is God in all of this? How am I to think of my relationship with him now? What am I to God? What is he to me? He's asking all of these reasonable questions. He's, he's, he's asking questions and he hasn't gotten any solid answers, at least not for many of his friends. But now we're going to hear from God. God is going to answer him. And it is not what any of us would expect the answer to be. Not at all but it's the right answer. This is the right answer that we're getting ready to study. You know, th here's, a, here's a little bit of a shift that's taking place right now in chapter 38. We don't have to decipher what's being said if it's right or wrong, right? We've been doing that, like when Job's been saying a bunch of things about God trying to, uh, you know, give his best answer. Sometimes he's right on the target, but other times it's kind of like, eh, I don't know if he should have said that. When Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, they're all over the place. Some things that they say is, are right. It's, they say true things about God much of the time. But then at other times, they're saying things that like, just aren't, that aren't useful, aren't good, and it's, it's wrong. And Elihu's the same way. We really had a hard time deciphering if, if he was a good guy or a bad guy. But now we're reading God's response. So we don't have to decipher anything. It's all right. It's all the right answer. So I, to me, I, as one preaching through this book, that at least is a huge relief to me right now <laughs> because this can be a difficult book to think through, read through, study through, and definitely preach through. But we don't have to cross that particular bridge. This is Yahweh. He is speaking, and he has the answer, and everything he says is right. Everything he does is right. So we know this is the right answer. Let's see what he says. Let's just jump right into the first three verses of Job 38. We're, only get, we're not going to get uh, through the entire chapter. We're going to get through 38 verses of it today. So here's the first three, though. It says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. I want to begin by pointing out something that's really easy to overlook here. Uh, this is God, and he has answered Job. Don't overlook that. He's answered Job. That's incredible. He answers Job out of a whirlwind here. Like, have you ever had somebody badmouth you in your life or run their mouth, uh, you know, uh, concerning you and, and how you live or whatever, but what they are saying is so ridiculous and so uneducated, what do we say? I'm not even going to dignify that with a response, 
right? Because that is so beneath me. I'm not even gonna, I'm not even gonna acknowledge that they said that. Probably most of us in here have at least had that thought, right? But God here, I mean, if, if we can feel that towards anyone, how much more can God feel that all the time? We're all so far beneath God in everything that we say and think about him. I mean, if anyone would ever have the right to say, I'm not even going to dignify that with, with a response, it's God. But he does dignify Job with a response. He dignifies Job. I think that's amazing. I think that's, I think that's incredible. Like, I'm never amazed that God doesn't speak to me out of a whirlwind. Like, I'm nothing. I'm nobody. I'm just some speck in the Midwest, irrelevant dude. I'm nothing. I'm never surprised when God doesn't crack open the sky and start talking to me, right? I can totally understand him not dignifying me with a response. <laughs> but here he's, he's dignifying Job with a response. I, it says a lot about Job, doesn't it? He loves, he loves Job. He chose to point out Job in the beginning of the book. But before we get too lovey-dovey with that thought, this is a terrifying moment for Job. After all, God is speaking to him out of a whirlwind. What a humbling moment for Job. When's the last time Job encountered a whirlwind? Oh, is when all of his sons and daughters died. A whirlwind showed up and killed his family. And now here, the, the, the method in which God is speaking to Job is that whirlwind again. He must have been petrified. He must have been so scared. You may remember his conversation back many chapters ago when he's responding to Eliphaz, or Bildad rather, in chapter 9. He's complaining about how God is elusive and I, I, I can't get a response from him. And then he says uh, almost sarcastically, if I did get a response from God, if he did talk to me, he'd probably crush me in a storm. And then here comes this whirlwind you gotta, be, you gotta know that Job's like, here it is, I'm a goner, it's over, he's gonna crush me, this is it. I mean, this, this whirlwind is definitely a statement to Job, right? God is not happy here. This is dangerous for Job. Without a doubt, he feels scared in this moment, and if what God has, uh, this theophany that has appeared, that is God speaking through this, this whirlwind, if that's not scary enough, I mean, uh, what he says makes it very clear that this is dangerous. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Who, who is this that, that knows nothing, that's confused and, and doesn't know what they're talking about? Who is this? Oh, I know, it's Job, right? We know, it's Job, it's Job again. Obviously, God knows the answer to this, right? He's making a statement. You think you want to confront me? You're going to confront me? You sure about that? Well, then dress for action like a man. Coolest verse in, in Job. <laughs> Coolest first verse. Dress for action like a man. Man up, let's go. I can't tell you how many times I've said that to my three boys growing up. <laughs> As they've grown up in my household. When you have three sons, there's a lot of flexing and fronting on each other and pushing and shoving and, right, they want to challenge you. And so you're like, let's go, come on, get up. And we wrestle it to the ground, you know. One of my favorite, all-time favorite memories of my three sons is when they were uh, so young that Reese was still in diapers. And I'm wrestling all three of them. Uh, you know, I got Nolan in a headlock. I got Emmett in a scissor hold. You know, I'm smacking them around. And there comes Reese around the corner, walks in. He's in a T-shirt and a diaper. And he's looking, and, and he can see his brothers are losing miserably. And he thinks for a second, he takes off his shirt and he charges after and just jumps right in. Superman dive. I was so proud of him, man. He manned up and got in on that action. That's, but that's the way all three of them were, you know. You're going to man up? Let's go. This is what God says to his servant Job. Stand up. Face me. Let's go. You want to question me? Stand up. It must have been terrifying. That would not be a warm and fuzzy moment. That would be a terrifying, horrible moment. But God is letting Job know, this is not going to go the way you hoped it would go all this time, Job. You're not the one who's going to be asking me questions because that's not how this works. You make it known to me. I'm going to be the one interrogating. I'm going to be the one asking questions. That's how this goes. No one gets to question me. 
4 through 7, look what, he, look what he says. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? And who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Well, uh, God loves rhetorical questions, if you haven't picked up on that yet. And this is just the, the first batch of many. So when it comes to rhetorical questions, right, if this was a test, you should all get a straight A, <laughs> like 100% on this test. All of these answers are obvious. Where were you? Well, he, he, he was nowhere. He didn't exist yet, right? Where were you when I was laying out the measurements? You know, God's like saying to Job right here, uh, you know, I remember creation. I, yeah, I remember that happening. Uh, don't, you, don't you remember it? Uh, wait, you know, I don't, I don't think I remember seeing you there, right? <laughs> it's just the sarcasm and the rhetorical questions. When I'm reading through this, you know, I want to think in my mind, no wonder I like rhetorical questions and sarcasm so much, like I'm like God or something, and I do it so sinfully whenever I do rhetorical questions and whenever I implement sarcasm into my daily life, but evidently, there's a way to do it that's not sinful, and it's this right here. It's God asking the, these rhetorical questions that have very obvious answers to put Job in his place. I'm the creator. You're the creation. I'm the potter. You're the clay. Jars of clay don't get to say to the potter, why have you done this? Why have you made me like this? So on and so forth. So the first thing he wants Job to know in that line of questioning is I'm the creator, and you know it. The next point is a statement about the sea which we've seen many statements on so far in Job. Let's see what God says about it, though. Let's take 8 through 11. Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out of the womb? When I made clouds its garment, and thick darkness its swaddling band, and prescribed limits for it, and set bars and doors, and said, Thus far you come, and no farther. And here shall your proud waves be stayed. So, the sea. We've mentioned this several times in Job, but it's important to remember anytime, especially in Job, when you see the sea mentioned, this represents something to people, the, the first audience to this. It represents chaos. That's how people would have thought of the sea. That's where chaos is. It's just an uncontrollable, swirling mess of chaos. That's the ocean. And so this is God who is saying, I'm in charge of the sea. Remember, so many references to the sea as we've gone through Job and Leviathan's there, or Rahab, those two names that, that represent that mythological creature that people would have thought lived there that was dangerous, the, the, the epitome of chaos, there, the, the kraken, if you will. And so the sea here uh, is used in a way that it's personified, and God's saying when it comes to the sea, it's like a little baby to me. I, I remember its conception. I remember it being born. I gave it clothes. I gave it a swaddling band. Compared to me, this is just a little baby. I gave boundaries for it, like I put it in its crib. And I, I told the sea, you can't go beyond this line right here, and, and it doesn't, because it minds me, it obeys me. All of that's under my control. All of, all of the evil and chaos, it falls under the, the providence of God. I, I think that, and we talked about evil in its relationship to God as we've gone through Job. I think it's one of the most difficult things to, to preach on and to think through. Evil and God. You don't even like to put evil and God in the same sentence unless it's God conquering evil. But Job is a great resource to expand what we, how we understand this relationship, right? And we need to, we need to handle, always handle that conversation with extreme reverence and care. But with that said, this resource teaches us over and over that there is a place for evil in God's creation. <clears throat> let's be careful with that. That's true, but let's be careful with that. When you think of evil, evil is not, evil is not some independent or autonomous power that is out of God's control. That's not what we see in Scripture. It, we see that there's a place for evil in God's creation, and since there's a place for it, there's limits to it. It's, it's restrained, and we see that from beginning to end, that when it comes to the sovereignty of God, his sovereignty extends even over evil. 
whew, okay, be careful. That makes us nervous, man. Be careful what you say when you put evil and God in the same sentence. You know, I think it's, I think it's such a great thing to learn, a, an assuring thing to learn in Scripture, actually. Why, why would it make us uncomfortable that God is, sovereignty, is sovereign over these things? I mean, what's the alternative, right? Would you rather believe that, that evil is outside of God's control, that it's, that it's spiraling out of control? I think it makes people nervous. Uh, I think when you think of evil and, and, and God in this world, people get nervous because it, it feels like evil is winning so much of the time, right? right? When you look out into this fallen and broken world, it's like, oh, man, is God winning? I don't know. You know I remember one time, uh, I, when I was younger, I was about 15 years old, I still had, from my younger days, even than that, I had this little 50cc Honda dirt bike. Now, if you've ever seen like a 15 or 16 year old kid on a 50cc dirt bike, uh, that's a tiny little, like I look like a circus bear on that thing when I would get on it at that point in my life. But it was fun to, to, to joke around with and to, to get out. And I remember I had some friends over and they're like, oh, you still got that dirt bike? I'm like, yeah, man, let's get it up, let's fire it up. And I was trying to impress them and there was a ditch in front of my house that you could like ramp down into and out of. And I was like, dude, check this out, right? Famous last words of every teenage boy, <laughs> watch this. And I get on there and my, you know, my knees are sticking out, I, the handlebars are real little. And I, I had these gloves on when I was uh, taking this, uh, the throttle back, and, and I take the throttle back, and, and now my, my glove and my hand, it gets stuck in between the brake and the throttles all the way up as I'm going down into this ditch to ramp back up out of it. And so I'm going full steam ahead, and I go down there. My plan is working great until it wasn't. And then uh, as, we, as I fly up on the other side of the ditch, like the dirt bike goes this way, and my body goes over this way. So now I'm like this. And we hit the ground, only my hand is still stuck on that throttle right there, and I can't get it off. And this dirt bike drags me around my entire front yard in a big old circle while my friends are just loving it. And I go flying back into the ditch where I finally crash. And, oh, man, it was, uh, it was fun. <laughs> but I, I, wonder, I wonder if people don't have an idea of God that's, similar to that, like everything was going according to plan until it wasn't, and then, and then everything starts spiraling out of control, and then, and then it's, it's not going according to plan at all, and now I'm in trouble, and now I'm wrecked back into the ditch, and, there, and everything went terrible. Can God handle this evil or not? The Bible makes it extremely clear all over the place. Evil, it has a place in God's creation but it is not out of his control. He is sovereign all, of, all over it. He, he, he can handle all of it, and he's gonna make that statement that he can handle it next in his rhetorical questions, 12 through 15. He says to Job, have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the seal and its, futures, and its features stand out like a garment. From the wicked, their light is withheld, and their uplifted arm is broken. He says to Job, you gonna question me and my sovereignty? Like, have you ever governed a single day? Have you ever commanded the sun to rise a single day, Job? Like I do every day. When it comes to wickedness on this earth, when that sun rises, it exposes the wickedness. This is this uh, poetry, that's the way it's being used. This light on the earth exposes wickedness, and, and, it, and God can just grab the, the skirts of the earth like a tablecloth whenever that wickedness is exposed by him, and he can just shake that tablecloth, and all that wickedness can be taken care of. The arm is broken. The uplifted arm is broken, right? That's how easy it is. God's saying to Job here, this is how little effort it takes for me to deal with evil. It's just a little shake of the tablecloth. No problem. No problem. It's no match for God. How do you think Job's doing at this point? I think it's important as you read through these rhetorical questions to kind of play a movie in your head of Job. Eyes on Job. What's he doing? Well, I can tell you what he's doing at this moment, for sure. He's being silent. When you get asked questions like this, in this way, right? 
Silence is the only response. Job's probably cowering beneath the wind that's beating down on him, and he's just keeping his mouth shut. shut. But God's got more questions. Look at 16 through 18. Have you entered into the springs of the sea and walked into the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare if you know all this. Looking down into the depth of the sea here, into that chaos, man, God's saying, I, I can get to the bottom of, of it all, right, and go beyond that. It, I can't help but when I read these passages, I think of like all of the James Cameron documentaries that I've watched in my life, and it's like a million, right? He, goes, he gets in his little torpedo sub, and he goes down to the bottom of the deepest part of the ocean he can get to. Have you seen some of those? And like, even with all the technology, which I did look it up, 6.7 miles is how far he's made it. And there's been people that have beat that by a little bit since. But, you know, even with the most advanced technology getting to the deepest part of the ocean, we just get down there, like, touch the bottom, like, go, go, okay, go, 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 go. Get, back, get out of there before this crushes us, you know, like a little pop can, right? We don't know anything going on down there. God takes it even further than that. He goes beyond the origins of the sea to the gates of death. If you could get past that, could you go even further? This is bigger than you could ever imagine, Job. This, is big, this, this reality is so far bigger than anything you can comprehend, Job. You don't even know where the front door of the realm of the dead is. You're just a speck. Look at verses 19 through 21. Where is the way to the dwelling of light? And where is the place of darkness that you may take it to its territory? and that you may discern the paths to its home. You know, for you were born then, and the number of your days is great. Can you catch, the <laughs> catch that taunt there, right? The sarcasm gets really thick right there. You know all about this stuff, don't you, Job? Yeah, you're old, right? You're older than creation, aren't you? Come on, aren't you? Answer me. At this point, you know Job, in that movie that's playing in your head of Job, you know that he's just like, wishing the ground would swallow him up right now so badly. He's just cowering there. Well, next, God's going to transition to the sky. Look at 22 through 24. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow? Or have you seen the storehouses of the hail, which I have reserved for a time of trouble, for the day of battle and war? What is the way, what is the way to the place where the light is distributed and where the east wind is scattered upon the earth? God's saying, I'm in charge of the skies, too, and all the destruction that exists there. Have you ever seen my warehouses of snow and hail? You have no idea. I could just rain down, dump all of that on this earth, and wipe everybody out, all the wicked I want. No problem. The light, I, I, I know where the breaker box is, do you? When it comes to the wind, I determine its path and where it goes. Do you? I think, I think it's neat to think of it this way, again, like when I think of the movie of Job playing in my head, when he starts to mention these different uh, forces of nature that maybe out of the whirlwind, that's what's hitting Job. As he starts to talk about the rain and the hail, I just imagine Job cowering down face to the ground and getting pelted with little bits of hail, getting hit with, with droplets of rain. They continue to play that out in your mind as I keep reading 25 through 27. Who has left, who, who, ha, who has cleft a channel for the torrents of rain and a way of the thunderbolt to bring rain on land where no man is, on the desert in which there is no man, to satisfy the waste and desolate land and make the ground sprout with grass? You know, again, is, did he experience a, like a, a cloud burst there and he's just getting drenched and soaked in rain? Keep imagining, 28 through 30. Has the rain a father? Or who has begotten the drops of dew? From whose womb did the ice come forth? Who has given birth to the frost of heaven? The waters become hard like stone and the face of the deep is frozen. You know, maybe at that point, the rain suddenly quit. Maybe there was a chill in the air. Maybe all of a sudden, Job, as he's cowering down there on the ground, he can see his breath in the air. It kind of made me think of those dark winter evenings, right? When there's snow on the ground, the snow absorbs all the, all the sound, right? It gets really quiet on winter evenings like that. 
Maybe everything just got really, really quiet for a moment. There's no more birds chirping in the air, no, no bug noises of summer that we're hearing right now. And, and maybe everything's getting really still, and maybe the clouds part in the sky, and maybe the stars start sticking out, because you think like on those winter evenings, sometimes you can just especially see the stars, right? Look at 31 through 33. Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? Can you lead forth the Maseroth in their season? Or can you guide the bear with its children? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Can you establish their rule on earth? These are all consolations, we think. We don't know all of these. Uh, uh, you know, Pleiades and Orion are obvious. Uh, you could probably point, most of you could point those out in the sky. Maseroth and Bear, those are probably names of constellations they had back then that we'd, we're not sure exactly uh, which one they're referring to now. Uh, but these are constellations in the night sky. And I just imagine that in that moment, as Job can see his breath on the ground there, he's looking up and he's now looking at the stars. And that is one of the, I, I think looking up at the stars is such a humbling thing to do. Like you can't, I don't care who you are or what you believe, you can't help but be in awe of the night starry sky. Side note, tonight is a clear sky and there's a meteor shower. So if you can stay up past 10 o'clock, a lot of times I can't, <laughs> uh, you can watch that meteor shower tonight. That's my goal. I got life goals tonight, but man, I'll, like I'll see one meteor and then I'll be like, okay, that's enough. But it's, it's amazing, though. You look, when you see stuff like that, it's just so amazing. I remember doing that. Our men's group uh, did, a, did a camp out last summer that Joseph put together for us, and we, we laid out in that field on a big tarp, and just, we were just counting the shooting stars. It was just amazing. You just can't, be in, you can't help but just be in awe of all of that. And it's amazing to me how people look, look at that expanse in the sky, and they go out of their way to subtract God from it. Because if you're not going to deal with God after looking in the starry sky, you got, you got to do something. you got to do something to subtract God from that equation. It's really hard to do, and people go out of their way to do it. They'll look up into that sky and, right, this means something. Th there's something there. This, th there's, there's, for some reason, when I look at that starry sky, it, I know that it's supposed to mean something to me. It matters to me. It influences me, Right? So they turn to the, to the horoscope or something. Oh, I think it's telling me something. I'm going to meet someone today that's going to change the rest of my life. That's what it's telling me. And my lucky lotto numbers are 12, 10, 13. <laughs> so, like, you know, what's, what is this nature speaking to me? Surely it's the Powerball number that it's trying to tell me to buy. It's, it's madness. It's just madness when people do this. It's God who skillfully placed the expanse, this expanse in the sky that's beyond what any of us can fathom. We can't even make it past the moon yet. It's like, if you're, still, if you're still playing that movie in your mind of Job, bring those clouds back in for a moment as we look at 34 through 38. Can you lift up your, lift up your voice to the clouds that a flood of waters may cover you? Can you send forth lightnings that they may go and say to you, here we are. Who has put wisdom in the inward parts or given understanding to the mind? Who can number the clouds by wisdom? And who can tilt the water skins of the heavens when the dust runs into a mass and the clods stick fast together? So now the clouds are back and maybe there's just a steady rain. Steady rain going, the water skins of the heavens are being sprinkled out on Job there. It's getting muddy beneath his feet. The dirt clods are underneath of him. And the point that God is making to Job is crystal clear. All of the forces of nature beyond what you even know about or will ever know about, they all obey me, Job, not you. It all, all of it, the chaos, everything, it all obeys me. This is such a powerful, powerful moment in Scripture and so informative for our faith because this is not at all what I expected God to say to Job. I mean, really, if you were just reading through Job for the first time, and maybe many of you have, 
and you, re, you started at chapter 1, and you got to chapter 38, only you got to chapter 38, and it's a blank page, and, and you were handed a pen, and you were supposed to write God's response. Write down what you think God would say to Job at this point. He's going to give him answers. What would you expect? Well, not this. That would have, this sort of response would have never crossed my mind. Because if I was going to write down what I think God would respond with, I, I think God would have responded to Job with what we know. He would have explained himself and all of the things that you and I already know from chapters 1 and 2. I would have expected God at this point to say, Job, well, okay, yeah, I decided I'm going to respond to you here. And here's what happened. I was, I was in heaven one day and Satan dropped by. And so I pointed you out to him. And, and then we had this little back and forth, and it, it resulted in, in Job being cut loose to wreck your life. And so, so or, um, and Satan, I, I, he cut Satan loose to wreck your life, Job. And so Satan did all of these things to you, Job, and that's why it's, it's all a disaster now. But, but hey, because you were faithful during all of it, buddy, I'm going to fix it. Don't you worry. The end. That's what, that would have been how I would have expected to end this book. But that's not what we get at all. It's not what we get at all. There, I think there would be something satisfying about that ending, but it would pale in comparison to the actual ending that we get in Job because my ending results in a real small God. God's ending results in an idea and a view of God that is bigger than I can even wrap my brain around. Right? And I think, I think a lot of times when we say, well, I... I would have expected God to say this, this, and this, or to do that, and this over here. When we say things like that, I think what we're actually saying a lot of times is, well, if I were God, here's how I'd handle it. And then we think we have the best idea. And then inevitably, whatever we say at that point, uh, it works out in our best interest every time, right? That's funny how that works. But we think we, think we know better than God. So often. One of the most audacious and presumptuous things that I've ever heard in a small group setting took place shortly after we launched our church, and I had a group of college students at my house. A couple of you were in this Bible study, but I remember something being said there that blew my mind. We were studying a passage of scripture, and we were struggling to decipher the meaning of it. We didn't, we didn't know what it was getting at. And so I felt what was happening there was a productive struggle, right? That's, that's the beauty of a journey group. You get in and you have a productive struggle together where not everybody is real sure of themselves and we're working together collectively to seek an answer that would honor God. So I, I, w I, I thought, <laughs> I felt like we were in this productive struggle, but we just didn't know what it meant or why it was there. And someone piped up, and I'll never forget him saying this, he says, you know what, if I was writing this, I could have done such a better job. <laughs> I was like so taken aback by the comment. I was like, wait, you mean like the Bible? Like you could have done a better job writing like the Bible? He said, yeah, so much of this is confusing and it's frustrating to try to figure out. And so I, I would have written a, 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 a so much clearer version of all of this and I, I could have done a way better job than this and everybody would understand perfectly. <laughs> I was that that is one of those moments where I'm like lightning okay where whoa hey whoa what are you saying like man ironically the passage we were studying was in Job you know it, it, it's crazy to think like I mean the way their mind works and I you know I want to cut him some slack right he's, he's a kid but it's like how, how ridiculous is it that sometimes we're like well if I'm frustrated and I don't understand, and I can see a simple answer, then God must be getting something wrong. How, prideful, how much pride does it take to think something so ridiculous to, towards the creator and sustainer of the universe that made every molecule that ever was? How, how much pride could it possibly take? Yet we're all capable of it. We all got it. You know, one of the biggest lessons we learn in this book is we're learning that, that the path to true wisdom, to the wisdom like what people like Job have, the path to true wisdom is humbling. If you're humbled 
on your pursuit of wisdom, that's how you know you're headed in the right direction. God's response, it dignifies Job and these rhetorical questions that, that are in God's response, they humble Job. And that's how Job gets wise. That's how he obtains it. So here's what we're learning about godly wisdom. Here's the ultimate issue in our pursuit of wisdom. Like, it, it doesn't teeter on whether or not I have this comprehensive understanding of suffering and evil in my life. That's not, that's not what wisdom in my life teeters on. What, what godly wisdom teeters on is whether or not I will bow down and worship in obedience in the midst of that suffering and evil. Are you doing that? When that moment comes for you, do you still want God then? Well, that depends on how wise you are. Spoiler alert. In the end, here's what happens with Job. The, the realization that God is God and Job is not, that's what makes Job wise. This is the pursuit of wisdom that we're after. It's a humbling pursuit. And if you truly want to gain the wisdom that Job has to offer us, it will be a humbling, sometimes humiliating experience. And only then will you truly have that wisdom that you and I are after when we get into this book. Let's pray. Lord, we're so grateful for this study together here in chapter 38. Lord, the, the path to true wisdom is humiliating. Uh, nowhere more is that it exemplified than in the life of Christ, right? His humiliation on the cross it led to his exaltation. And your son, Jesus, he is wisdom from you. He's the epitome of it. May we meditate upon that so that we can contemplate how we want to live and think in our lives. Do we want wisdom that's from you? May we humble ourselves in a time of communion. And it's in your name, Jesus, that we ask these things. Amen.